Welcome to Cold War Conversations. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Well, who's our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Brian Hartley of Thornton the Field, asking what's being done to build up Anglo Soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 12 of Cold War Conversations. Today's guest is someone I've been trying to speak to for some time, as his story is a particularly fascinating one. We're chatting with Mark Reeder, a musician and music producer who's been involved in the Berlin and international music scene since 1978, starting as Factory Records' German representative. Through his contacts in the GDR, he put on several secret punk gigs behind the Iron Curtain, and his Stasi file is described as as thick as a phone book. He is, however, denied access to the full file as it remains in the possession of the German Federal Intelligence Service. More about that later. He's also the founder and owner of the first East German electronic dance music label, Masterminded for Success, MFS, which he started in 1990 after being the only and last Westerner to make an album in East Germany in 1989. His is a very interesting and unusual account with some great stories, including how he smuggled a Volksarmee uniform across the Berlin Wall and the unusual currency needed to get your phone fixed in the GDR. We join our conversation as Mark describes how he took the popular UK TV show The Tube around Berlin. Well, if you need to know anything about it, just call Mark Reed up, he'll be able to help you put it together. And so I was lumbered with this job of like the, doing the research for this program, of which, you know, I ended up doing everything for this program. It was like, I didn't just do the research. I did, I, you know, I ordered the, the, the permits, got all the permits so they could, because you couldn't just film on the streets here. It wasn't, it, right. it wasn't like in, in, in England, you know, you, everything was controlled by the Allied powers. So it was yeah. like, you, you know, you had to have your passport with you all the time. Uh, you know, you, had, you couldn't just film on the streets because otherwise you get arrested and carted off. Uh, everything, everything was a military installation, so it was really you had to get all these like permits and stuff. Yeah, and um, you know, and I said to the shoe, well, if you're going to do Berlin as a city, you know, it's not just West Berlin; it's another part on the other side of the wall. And and so I, I I went to all the trouble to kind of like get them to do a program about the whole of Berlin, not just East West Berlin, but also East Berlin. Yeah. Well, they, they, you know, we had the Tödliche Doris and we had Einstürz and the Neubauten and Die Haut and things like bands like this representing West Berlin. Yeah. And the Tube obviously wanted something similar to represent East Berlin. But I'm trying to explain to them that, you know, that there's no such thing in the eyes of the East German government, in the eyes of the East German authorities, there's no such thing as punk. There's no such thing as like, you know, it doesn't exist because the East Germans believe that punk was born out of the feelings of capitalism and through unemployment and because they had mass unemployment punk rock emerged but as there's no unemployment in the farmer and worker state of east germany it's impossible to yeah. have punks right this was their mindset yeah what yeah they thought and i'm like well you know we can hardly have a punk band on on the program because they never get past the census so i have this task of trying to find a, a suitable representation of East German youth that would equally be appealing not only to the East German authorities but also to the to the British television viewers and I was like really struggling to to find something these Germans kept trying to fob off these aging geriatric rockers like from the 60s like the Poodies and Silly and City and Carhartt and bands like this and I'm like the the youth of, of England will never be able to identify with these geriatric blokes you know so I, I was getting nowhere. Yeah. And just by sure, pure chance, I was sitting on the tram one day going through East Berlin. And um, 
And I saw this kid with the, two guys walking down the street with an electric guitar and I jumped off the tram and ran, ran after him, stopped him and said, you know, have you got, you've got a guitar in there, you're in a band. And they were like, well, yeah, why? And, and I tried to explain, do you want to be on British television? <laughs> and now they, like, these kids just looked at me like, as if I was from another planet, you know, like they had no idea. They're like, what is this guy? This crazy English guy asking me to go on British like, TV. Right. Because the thought of actually, you know, they, they tried to explain to me that they had no permit to actually play in front of an audience. They, mm-hmm. they, they were a band that played in the cellar just for themselves. And they had, as, as much as they dreamt about being on, you know, on stage in front of an audience. They never, ever had done a, even done a gig in front of a, an audience before. Right. They just played in their practice in the practice room in the basement of a school. Yeah. And um, and I went, well, oh, let's let me, let, can I come and see you play? See what you do? Because they said, what kind of music do you play? And they were like, well, we like the police. We like the police, so our music's a bit like that. And I thought, now the police is kind of safe. You know, it's like that might it might be the. The, the borderline between acceptability you know, in the eyes of East Germany and, and, and borderline for the UK because we yeah. have a few hits in the UK. So I went along to their practice place after like a lot of haggling trying to get them to take me there. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, I was like really blown away by the way these guys just like just gave me this performance, you know, and they, they never played in front of anybody before, you know. Right. And, and I was like, wow, they're really good. You know, they'd made their own instruments. They'd made the, this keyboard had made its own synthesizer. The the guitarist had made his own guitar. You know, oh. the bass the bass player had managed to get a guitar from Hungary via some auntie who'd kind of like brought it as a gift or something. And it was like, wow, you know, these guys are so determined and so so. You know, I thought I'll try and get these on the telly. Yeah, but when I went to the authorities. You know, I said, I said, I, I, I think I found a band, and they were like, "What's the name?" I said, "They're called Jessica." And they, they were, just a minute, and the the hair cool was the guy from the 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 the, 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 the guy was looking. Yeah, what a great he was very, hair cool. He was very, he was very cool. He was he, he was stony face, dressed in a brown suit, and he'd go off, and I think he'd have a fag, and came back, and went, "Oh, we'll have, we'll have to we'll have to apply to find out who these guys are. They don't have a permit." And I said, how did you find them? And I think, shit, I want them to tell me. I can't tell them I've just met them on the street. You know? <laughs> so I said, oh, I, I, I was at the House of Young Talent, aptly named place, um, and I was, I was looking at some of the bands playing there, and one of the guys in, uh, 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 from the Free German Youth told me that there's a new band called Jessica who are actually really good, and I should look at them. And he's like, we don't know this band. We'll have to look into it come back next week and yeah. we'll give you the information. So I went, I w- w- walked out of this meeting, I ran immediately to the phone box and I immediately phoned the band and said, right, you've now got to go immediately to the Free German Youth at the House of Young Talent and tell them that you've heard this this uh, rumour that British Television wants to put you on the telly <laughs> and they, the Free German Youth have to vouch for you. And because luckily the one the guys they knew the people like some of the guys that worked there, yeah, they actually did exactly that. They vouched for them and said, "Yeah, we've heard of this band and they're really good." And and so this, you know, these German authorities had no idea that I hadn't been any personal contact with this band. Yeah, but it was like this kind of cat and mouse game whereby I'd get the information off the authorities, I'd tell the band, the band then kind of like. You know, it was like a circle of like information that was doing the rounds, you know. And they eventually managed to get them on the telly. And it was the first time ever, you know, really on British television that an East German band had ever appeared on telly. But it was the first time ever that anything like that had ever happened in East Germany as well. You know, yeah. a, a completely unknown band with no permits to own electric instruments, no permits to play in front of an audience, no permits whatsoever to exist as a band, rightfully, was suddenly being put on, on British television. Now, these Germans didn't want to be upstaged by the two because they were petrified that it was like, like they'd be blacklisted for the, f- the fact that British television managed to find this fantastic band that's been on, on British television and, th- and, and they don't know anything about it. So, so they got these kids to be on the East German pop program, like literally the week before, <laughs> just so they could say we, you know, we did it first. Yeah, it was a, hilar- it was hilarious. Wow, yeah. wow. But before, I... before, before I did that though, yeah. before I did that, that, that event, that that t- tube uh, program, 
I'd actually managed to smuggle another band into East Berlin to do a secret illegal concert. And that was a band called De Toten Hosen, the Dead Trousers, yeah. who were a punk punk band, who I, I was their live sound engineer. So I was on tour with them all the time. And I knew them from being like early punk rock days right. in, 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 in Berlin. And um, they, they, it's like, okay, I, 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 I played myself in Czechoslovakia with my band. Yeah, I had a band called The Unbekanten. The Unbekanten means the unknown. And, 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 I'd, and I'd been to Czechoslovakia and I met these guys and they invited me to play there at an illegal concert disguised as a wedding reception. Uh, and, and they invited like Czechoslovakia's most wanted to this flight. What was once a kind of like a Napoleon, Napoleonic era service station on the road from Dresden to Prague, right, which was no longer in use. And this kind of like derelict thing was there and, they, and it, was, oh, it belonged to one of these guys, uncles. Yeah. So we had the run of this place and, the, and as they disguised it as a wedding reception, it kind of didn't, didn't fall too much in the, on the eyes of the authorities that it was going to be a gig. It was just like, well, oh, these people are going to get pissed at, at this location. Just leave it, you know, but they, what they didn't realize was like, it was literally Czechoslovakia's most wanted dissidents all converged on this place. You know, and people who eventually went on to overthrow the government later on. You know, yeah, like so this here. was quite a few people from Charter 77. and All of them, wow. apart from Václav Havel. Right? <laughs> uh, well, that's um, not, still not bad going. But, it was but, like, yeah, it's like all plastic amazing. people of the universe, Garage, all these people uh, yeah, yeah. from different bands. Jakim uh, uh, Topol, Sasha Vondra, all these people. Uh, David Copeland, his father, David Copeland's dad was was a famous like avant garde composer in, in, in Czechoslovakia, and he was a Charter seventy seven signature, and he got and he got he got banned from playing, and his son helped to Jakub Topeland write Revolver Review, this kind of dissident periodical that they release uh, yeah. once a month, and um, and we, this these were the guys who who had this gig, and I that went there with my friend Alistair. We went and played our gig there in Czechoslovakia. Not knowing, we, you know, we thought this kind of thing happened all the time, you know, you have no <laughs> idea that no one had ever done this before, you know. Yeah. And, and I didn't know this until after I'd done the Total Nosen concert that this was actually the fact. That, yeah, I, I, you know, after we'd done the Total Nosen concert in East Berlin, mm. um, then, then it kind of manifested itself, where, you know, that this was the first time that anyone ever re- dared to do such a thing. Yeah. And, so, and I'd only, only, only dis- discovered that I could do this by chance. You know? So, how did you get the band? into east berlin because i i sort of read that you know anybody who looked slightly how can i say it different trying to get through checkpoint charlie or friedrich strasser would have got turned away yeah normally you would have done i, I was so i was so desperate to get the band you know i'd go i always go went went into east berlin looking as current service if possible you know if you look like a bank manager you, you got in no problem you know but totten holes did not look like bank managers they look no. like punk, right <laughs> And I, and I tried to explain to them where, where your most kind of the worst clothing you can think of that's that that's bland, you know, like just go as bland as you possibly can. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what they did. You know, they they went fairly bland, um, and, and and we man, you know, we went in groups of three, staggered over the morning, so that it, no, it wasn't a big group of people all trying to get in at once. Mm. So it was like groups of three, and no one was allowed to know acknowledge the, the others and stuff. And we got everybody over, you know, into into East Berlin, and then we 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 we'd, we found a band called Plan Los who had a, a guitar and a bass and a half a drum kit and one amplifier and some guys from Feeling B who went on to later to become Rammstein. They lent us the other guitars and a microphone, and then in this church because I'd heard like months before, I'd heard that. Um, the, the the church did a, did a, a weekly thing, a monthly thing called us, a blues mass, mm-hmm. which was basically you could sing, you know, Bob Dylan songs and Eric Clapton and stuff like that. <laughs> this hippie kind of I was listening to a conversation I was having and, and we got talking about music and he, and he told me that he had an electric guitar and he played at this blues mass and I was like, where's this? And he, yeah. he wrote it down for me and I went to the priest and asked him, can I do, can I do a gig? And he was like, it's not a gig, it's a church service with prayers. I'm like, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. So I was thinking of going there with my band, but no one had let no one had let us have a cassette record because a cassette player because cassette players were like gold in East Germany. Yeah, you know that's what you recorded your John Peel show on, and thought if the if the gig is 
is raided by the police, so everything will get confiscated. And they didn't want if anything got confiscated, it couldn't be that. Yeah. So we couldn't we couldn't do the gig, you know. So we ended up doing the Total Nose instead. And in the in retrospect, it was probably a better idea. Really. Right. Because the and, Total Nose and sang in sang in German. You know. Okay. And did the and not, and all, all my friends knew the songs because I smuggled all their cassettes into it. <laughs> 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 and and did so the audience knew it was the Toten Hosen, but as far as oh yeah yeah anybody else it was well the, the people who we'd invited we invited thirty people yeah to kind of minimise the risk you know it's yeah like, you, you couldn't invite it wasn't a secret gig like a Prince concert where he'd turn up in a big, big van you know at, the, at yeah, some yeah. venue and kind of you know it, it was this was very 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 top secret very 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 dangerous. You know, for the people doing it. I said to the, it was actually two girls, my friends, you know, the, the one girl who'd met me in the Palace of Republic and her friend. Right. I said to them, you know, look, 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 if we do this, you know, if we get caught, the first thing that's going to happen to me is that they'll throw me out of East Germany and I'll never come back and you'll never get any new music from yeah. me. But, but if you get caught, your lives will be changed forever, you know. Yeah. It's like that. And, you, you and they still lives. wanted to go ahead with that, even at that risk. Oh, yeah. The, but, uh, it was more about the thrill, really, of doing something like that. It was about, they knew that I was having this thrilling time smuggling music into East Berlin and bringing all these people over for, to me, uh, introduce them to John Peel and people like this, you know. Yeah. And it was, and, and for them, that was like, you know, thrilling, you know. It was like, yeah. obviously, I was having a thrilling time. Uh, they didn't know, never realized how nerve wracking it was trying to smuggle the cassette into East Berlin. You know, like if I got caught, I would never come back in. But, yeah. You know, th- the things would have happened. Yeah. But um, th- th- they wanted to also have this, th- this piece of action, you know, this thrilling uh, feeling that they're doing something illegal, totally illegal, I think. And that's what drove them. They wanted to see the tote nose and they wanted to meet Campino. They wanted to meet the band, you know. So yeah. it was like, well, we don't care. Just let's, yeah. just regardless of the consequences, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, and so so, so they organise it. So it was it was more about the the thrill of doing something illegal rather than a a protest or anything like that. Or? Well, it had nothing to do with protest at all. Yeah, it, had, it really had nothing to do with that. Really, they they knew it was a kind of it was, the church in itself was a form of silent protest against the state, right? If you were in, if you were in part of, were in part of the church, you know, if you joined the church, that was like a say, it was like a saying to the, to the, to the communist government, you know, like sod off. You know? It was like, it was like, that was the kind of silent protest and, and the church within the confines of the church, people could do really whatever they wanted, but the Stasi was there all the time. Everyone was watching them. You know? um, but they knew that the people knew that if you, if you had anything to do with the church, we were under observation, but we thought let's see how far we can take this you know and so we only invited 30 people to try and minimize the risks of like anyone telling and it was 30 of their so-called trusted friends you know not right. at the time we weren't weren't really a, you know I, I knew that stasi were everywhere and everyone everything was like secret police state and everything you know you never knew whether someone was listening to your conversation mm-hmm. wherever you went yeah, but I thought my friends obviously know their friends, so they've got to be kind of wary about who's going to come to this gig and who they're going to tell. Yeah, so so they invited thirty people. We said no photos. We got the priest. I had a camera with me. Just got the priest to take one photograph mm-hmm. and was standing in front of the shirt, and that was it. But wow. unknown to us, there were people there from the Stasi in our group of friends who did actually take some photographs and actually like t- told on us afterwards. Right? Yeah. But the interesting thing was they didn't tell on us before. Now, the reason why is because they wanted to see the gig. They wanted to, <laughs> they wanted to be part of that, you know. Yeah, yeah. There was, was a one-off opportunity to see the Tone Olsen perform in East Berlin. Yeah, too like, good I'm, to I'm, miss. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to miss that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to scuttle that before it's happened, you know. I, yeah. can t- I can tell the authorities afterwards. And that's what they did, you know. Um, funnily enough, like the next, we did, a, we did a, another gig five years later in Pankow, or in the churchyard, in a kindergarten churchyard, um, part of the church in Pankow. And it was like uh, this band called Division, which were like a new wavy kind of rock band who sang in English. The only band in East Germany allowed to sing in English because the singer studied English at the university, Humboldt University. Yeah. We did this, this gig as a benefit concert for starving Romanian orphans. And we get to this concert. We'd only invited 30 people again for this gig. And when we get there, there's like 500 people there. 
that no one could keep the trap shut. Because, but in the meantime, this total nosen gig had become so mythical. It sparked off this huge kind of wave of punk bands going to the churches and asking if they could use the church as a practice place, place where they could play and do gigs. Right. And, and so the churches of East, the whole throughout the whole of East Germany suddenly became this kind of like refuge for, for struggling punk rock bands. Yeah. Churches, the, the priests were really happy because it meant there, were, there was young people coming to the church, you know, yeah. they didn't care. They, they didn't like the music necessarily, but like, look, they weren't, they weren't bothered about that. They could see the statement within the statement, you know, yeah, and 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 that and and so when we did the second gig, that was like, oh shit, what are we going to do now? You know, the police are sat outside in their larder, and there's, there's like five hundred people converged on this place, and the priest, when we arrived, says, "I'm sorry, but the police have just told us that Tottenham and can't play under no circumstances." And we're sitting here, like, oh, what are we going to do? And he said, "You're going to have to tell the people that you know this is this, the state have said this." The priest was like, oh. There's so many people. So, yeah, just tell them that, that you know, Tolton Hosen can't play, but uh, a band from Dresden are going to play in the place. And he's like, like what band? Um, they don't know what the Tolton Hosen look like, do they? <laughs> 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 Pretend that they're a band from Dresden. And that's exactly what we did. Oh, brilliant. And, then, and, the, and, and the band played for three quarters of an hour. And because of his all, in all these people, there was obviously Stasi informers, you know. Yeah. They after three quarters of an hour, they obviously knew they couldn't they couldn't hang out anymore and wait for it to to finish. So the the police came and said, "Right, we we know your plan now. We know lots of Tottenham holes and yeah. stop stop the gig." And we were thinking, "Oh God, this is it now. We're all going to get arrested." And stuff. Yeah. Nothing happened. Nothing actually happened. They let us all disperse. It was too many people. Really. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I think it would have caused too much of a problem if yeah. they'd actually done something. Physical. And what year was what year was this? Eight eighty eight. Right, okay. 88. No inclination of fall of the building wall at this point. No inclination that anything was going to go down of any sort. Right. It was, it, it was just quite, you know, it was, it was a quite a tense moment, but then it, once the gig had ended and everyone was really happy, it, it was quite a pleasant atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in 88, there's, there's just no sense of, of change at all. It's just no, no. business as Not, usual in East Germany. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It was only that my friends told me that in the subsequent weeks for, after this gig, all the flats got raided by the Stasi. You know, like they, they, well, they wait, the Stasi would wait till they went out shopping or they went, you know, went out in drinking in the evening or whatever. And they'd break into the flats and then they'd just photograph all the stuff, all yeah. the records, all the periodicals, all this stuff. You know, get as much information they could on the people. You know, and turn them really. And yeah. you know, my friends, my friends said, "Oh yeah." And the next door neighbour told us that the stars were in our flat. <laughs> you know, um, so so we knew, we knew. You know, and as we, because they were my friends, and then in the meantime, I'd befriended some American soldiers in the meantime, and we'd managed for the second Total Nose of concert, we'd managed to smuggle the guitars and the camera into the, into East Berlin, and 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 they were very very interested in this person, you know, and this guy. Going, this American soldier and his job in the US Army and stuff like that, and they wanted to know the connections and everything. It was a, it got a bit kind of unsavory. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And d- did you have? I mean, you mentioned that. I mean, you're obviously crossing the border a lot of times. Yeah, were the border cards familiar with you, or did they just treat you the same each time? Or was the, did you develop a familiarity with these guys? Well. No, there was one guy who went in the very, very early, like like seventy nine. It must have been. He was just a just a kind of like a normal squaddy type border guy. Yeah. He, I, I didn't have a key for my flat. I had I had a skeleton key for the flat that I was living in because I was living in a in a house that was about to be torn down. It was, it, was a, it wasn't derelict. It was just yeah. an old house, and the, and the and the government was tearing down all the old houses. So I was staying with this group of students who were waiting to be put into another flat. And they said, you can stay here for as long as you want until the house gets torn down. So I didn't have a key for the flat. I only have a, a, a skeleton key. So I went to East Berlin one day, and this, this guy just decides to search me. And he's searching my pockets, and I pull out the skeleton key, and he's like, what's this? I said, oh, it's my door key. He goes, no, you're coming to East Berlin to break into people's flats. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> wild guess. And, like and 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 then and then it's they strip search me. Now yeah. 
I was taking, I'd, I'd been to Czechoslovakia and met some East Germans in Czechoslovakia and I'd taken some photographs of them and I, and I decided I'd duplicate the photographs and then take them into East Berlin so they have a sort of, you know, my, my photographs as kind of memory of our, yeah. our time together, you know. But I knew that I couldn't take them in the pockets in case I got searched because they'd say, how do you know these people? Because I wasn't really... Some, they weren't supposed to have contacts to Westerners and I certainly wasn't supposed to contact any Eastern Germans. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm supposed to be just a tourist going to Alexanderplatz to eat, you know, Erzatz ca- drink Erzatz coffee and eat cake, you know. Yeah, and have your uh, and, uh, vinegar soused cabbage. You know, whatever. <laughs> I, I wasn't supposed to have any contacts with you. Germans at all, and then they see these photographs. I suck them, sellotape them to me, sat to my leg, and as they strip search me, sees these, and then they get like you know, hauled over the coals. We were these people. Where do you meet? I said, I have no idea. I just took the photograph, and I said, well, I'll meet you on Alexander Platz, and I tried to fake it that I didn't know these people. Yeah, they can't. Well, I thought they they'd bought into this kind of cock and bull story that I'd concocted, but in actual fact, it was just. They really were really, really interested in what I was doing, you know. Yeah. Because they'd, I'd already been flagged by this guy who the first, that first punk rock kid that I met you know, mm-hmm. on, the, on the underground, he was actually a Stasi informer. And as I'd asked him about the underground scene of East Berlin, he'd immediately informed on me, literally like an hour later. Right. So that he'd met this English guy who was looking for the underground scene in, in, in Berlin yeah. and he had me addressed and everything. So I was flagged immediately and it was like all these generals and everything come, come to interrogate me, you know, like what are you doing and where are you going? Are you going to meet? And yeah. And the, and, the, and the KGB were very interested in my mission as they thought I was on. A mission to corrupt the youth of East Germany through music. And well, they were right, weren't they? <laughs> well, well I, I didn't see it as corruption. I yeah, no. As education. Yeah. You know, but they they saw it as subversion, and they even the, the KGB was so determined to find out what it was I was doing in East Berlin that they asked their informant in our MI5 to look into the the fact, you know, possibility that I, I might be on a black operation of some kind and not like hidden somewhere in the archives of MI5. There might be a file with my, my name on it, and they'd be able to like you know get me that way i was like what is this fantasy world we were living in it reminded me of like you know that film burn after reading it was a bit like that yeah wow so did have you ever uh got your stars far from the archive yeah yeah of course yeah and but i'm, but I'm not i'm not allowed to see all my stars if i'm i've only i'm only allowed to see a fifth of my stars if i why, why is my, that but the rest of my stars if i was nesting in the archives of the the Bundesnachrichtendienst, which is the federal German uh, security agency. And that's all, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of things that I don't know, that I'm not allowed to know about my activities in East Germany and Czechoslovakia and Hungary. Uh, and so and so they're protecting some people. Whatever, I don't know. I'm not allowed to see it. I was only allowed to see a very small part, portion of the file. And, and, and when I, I, I went, I opened the... Um, the when the Stasi Museum at the Normanstrasse reopened after refurbishment and after they kind of like made this special exhibition and stuff, I gave a talk at the opening evening of that mm-hmm. uh, museum uh, about my activities. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I actually met all the people who were from the BSTU who look after the Stasi files and said, well, you know, it's been now like nearly 30 years, whatever. What's the possibilities that I might be able to gain, gain access to this file? And said, oh, we'll look into it for you. And this January, they wrote me a letter saying, we're really, really sorry, but we're, we're not allowed to have access to your file. We, we know you have got one. We know it's as thick as a telephone book, but you're not allowed to see it. Wow. And so no indication when you might, when that, you know, you know, like in Britain, they have like the thirty-year rule or something like that. But. I've no idea. They've not said anything at all. The wow. Christian, Christian Dean won't reply to any of my correspondence. So. Yeah, it's like you know, what? Well, why can I not see my yeah. the rest of my file? What's in there? You know? Yeah, well, I, have, I have my suspicions. You know, I'm, that's, I have my 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 version of events, and you know, so why? But yeah, it, it's like you know. It, it could be. I think everybody wanted to know who I was working for, right? both the East and the West, because I'd go to Czechoslovakia a lot, you know, go to Hungary, 
Mm-hmm. Went to Romania, you know, places like this, and Poland. They were very interested in what, what you, why are you going there? You know, what's you, what are you doing there? Yeah. You know, who are you working for? Yeah. And that's, and, and, and what they didn't understand was that it was, I was working for my friends, you know, give it, I was just bringing them happiness, music, you know, f- people who were involved in music, people they could meet. Yeah. Who, who were from the music business. Yeah. Just, 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 it was just that, you know, it had, I had absolutely no ulterior, ulterior motive. Yeah. Reason, like, yeah. Friends, you know, but that would be beyond their comprehension. Oh, completely. That, 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 that's what you were. And when, when you were stopped, you know, going in and you said you, you, you know, you were interrogated, did they try and sort of say, you know, if you become an informer, we'll let you go or, or anything like that? No, they didn't know. Right. They didn't know. Because I think, I think that if they'd have done that, that would have been even more compromised. Because cause I think the, the, for them, the, the, their idea was, where's he going? This is, this is what, this is what they, the, the, the parts of my Schnauzer file that I'm allowed to see, what it, what it said in the margins and things. It was like, we have to find out what his agenda is. He's obviously got some kind of, of agenda or some kind. He's going somewhere. He's taking this someplace. So mm. we have to find out where he wants to go. It's like, don't get him now, because if you get him now, we won't find anything now. But find like just watch him. In in the in the end, it got got to such a point where at the end, um, I was asked to produce an album in East Berlin. Right? Now, yeah. as a normal Westerner, you're not allowed to go into factories or any place that manufactures anything. You know, any anything to do with like telecommunications of any kind. You're not allowed to just go anywhere near these places. But when when Jessica had had their success after being on British television, they they were playing the some kind of gig at some at uh, RFT, which is like the, the television making part of East Berlin. It's mm-hmm. a big factory in the outskirts of Berlin that had a big stage, and it was all the people who worked. It was their their yearly par- party, or whatever. So everybody who worked in this factory was at this this gig, and the band invited me to this gig. So I went along there and I pass- presented my passport at the entrance and stuff, and I walked and sat down. And within five minutes, they. They came and said, you can't stay. You've got to leave. And I'm like, why? He said, well, you might steal the secrets. I'm like, you mean, steal like black and white television sets. <laughs> you know, it's like they drag and they hold me off and drag me off and, you know, said, you can't stay here. You have to go. Uh, literally, they picked me up and dragged me out. You know? Wow. And um, so I was quite aware of that, you know, that you're not allowed to go in places like this. But here I'm getting an invitation to produce Division as a band. Now, see, after the Total Nose concert, the Division, their their popularity was grew, grew very rapidly. You know, from from playing, you know, in front of two people to playing in front of twenty thousand, kind of thing. You know, in the space of a few months, kind of just rocketed because of the fact that they have, they'd done this gig, mm-hmm. and and the popularity was so big that the, the, these Germans are like, what we're going to do? The authorities are like, we're, we're going to either ban them which will make them martyrs and we won't be able to control whatever happens after that. Whereas if we assign them to the record label, the state or record label, the Amiga, then we can control their output. We can control what they do. So mm-hmm. that's, that's exactly what they did. Uh, and they needed, the band needed a producer. So they asked me if I would produce their record. So, I, so that's, I'm that's complete. Sure. That must've been completely unheard of, of, you know, a foreigner and a Westerner particularly, um, producing a, a record for the GDR state-owned label. It it never happened before, and 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 I, well, I I was aware of this. I thought I thought this happened all the time. You know? so yeah, the, you know, there are other bands that were much more popular and bigger, or whatever. And they almost had producers from the West producing their albums and stuff. Mm-hmm. I was com- completely unaware that no one had ever actually done this before. So I went to East Berlin and you know spent months trying to make this album. So it was a nightmare making this album. Their, their recording studio was a very, very beautiful place. It was an old cinema and it had been converted into this wonderful studio. But everything in the studio had been handmade. It was all like, it was like Frankenstein's monsters. You know, it was like that kind of thing. It was a ha- made out of all these bits that they'd, that they'd acquired somehow. But they had like real instruments. They had like, you know, I think in 1968, they'd been given a bunch of money from the, from the, authority, from the, the state to go and buy a, a piano, Steinway Grand Piano, 
by a Stratocaster, you know, by all these amplifiers and yeah. microphones and everything. So they don't, you know, make, make this studio into a proper recording studio with, with the high end equipment that you can only get if you come to our studio. You know, I, I, I sat there for months, you know, with power fluctuations and the fact that when we started making this LP, East Germany had started to fall apart. And, and w- w- what I didn't know though was that everybody in the studio were all, informers for the Stasi and they were all informing on me and the idea was that because I, I could stay there until after midnight I had to work for them I could stay there for longer than life. right so it was like it was like you know I'd, I'd work there through the night and go home at like four o'clock in the morning or something and it'd be like you know they wanted to know what I'm doing where you're going what do you do after you've been in the studio who are you going to see and then at one point the, the singer said, oh, you can just come and stay in my flat. There's a flat upstairs. It's empty. It's fully furnished. You can stay there. And I'm like, I don't know about that. Is it, whose flat is it? He goes, oh, it's just like, I've got the key. So I said, well, who, who lives there? Well, it, was like, it was very ambiguous, you know, about what, who, 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 what I was, I, was I, don't, I don't feel so good about this. And then yeah. One, one night, you know, we weren't really late and I decided, okay, this time I'll go and stay there. And they walk into this place, and it just just seemed so weird. It was like it was a big mirror on the wall, and I was like, "I don't mind the look of this. This is not, yeah. This is not really what it's supposed to be." And I was, Are you sure I'm supposed to be here?" You know. Um, in the end, it turns out the singer of the band was in the stars. You know, it was like everyone was in the stars. They just wanted to know what you do, what you who you going to meet, who you're yeah, talking to. You know. Wow. Did you feel that? Did you get an impression you were being followed, or or not? No. No, never, never. I didn't know because the people who were in this, who were informing on me were my friends. Yeah, you know, they were. The, yeah. they were the people that I knew. You know. Yeah. There's one person. It was a girl. She wasn't the two girls who'd done the concert, but she was. She was one of their closest friends. Mm. She was the worst informer of everybody. You know? She was like. She was like really destru- destructive in her inf- information. You know, and it was like yeah. a lot of people suffered through her. Her telling. You know, but like the fact is, nobody. And even the people who got to see the Stasi files later were all flabbergasted to find out that it was this girl because nobody suspected her in a million years. It was like real eye opener. They were like, wow, she was really hardcore informer. Yeah. I, I was going to come on to the sort of fall, fall of the wall. But back, back to the record, did it sell well? Oh, well, the, the thing is, well, while I'm making this album, the, yeah. the, the A&R from Amiga... He's like, he said, can you put a few tracks on a cassette? I can want to go around to the record shops and present it. And so I did a couple of tracks on a cassette, for rough mixes, and he went off his Traband. And, and, you know, a couple of weeks later, he comes back to me, we've got 32,000 pre-orders for this record. And I'm like, it's not even finished. He's like, 32,000 pre-orders. It's an immense amount of records. Yeah. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the money? I'm like, well, what do you mean? Because I'm like, going to get paid in East German Mars. What are you going to do with that money? I'll take it out of East Germany. I thought, I don't know. I've no idea. I'll buy a new toaster. And he's like, no, I'll, I'll show you what you can buy. I'm like, oh, God. And it takes me one rainy night in East Traband around Panko. Yeah. Panko was, was known as Volvograd because it was where all the rich people lived. <laughs> And anyone who was really rich in East Germany, like sportsmen and television personalities and things, they all could all own Western cars. Right. But the, the only car that they owned was a, was a Volvo because Sweden wasn't part of NATO, so they could put you know drive Volvo car. Yeah. Very few Mercedes Benz. But anyway, like, like, he's driving me around, going that villa's free and that villa's free, and you could live. I'm thinking, I live in a twenty square meter apartment in West Berlin that costs 80 marks and, he's, and here is this guy showing me these villas that I can buy with all the money that I'm going to make in East Germany I mean I'm going to have to live in East Germany live in, live in East Berlin Pankow in a villa it's like <laughs> so bizarre but as fate would have it the Berlin Wall came down before we finished the LP I finished recording it I finished yeah. recording the album I finished recording it on the 2nd of November 1989 and then I went with some friends, Dave Rimmer, and he's from a friend called Trevor Wilson, who ran this magazine called the Schimbach Stamps Out, which is kind of a very controversial magazine here in Berlin, kind of like a German version of Private Eye. Right. Um, he's English too, yeah. So we decided to go on a holiday to Romania on a road trip, traveling from Berlin to Krakow, 
then down to Czechoslovakia, into Hungary, and then from there to Romania. So we left Berlin in the night of the 8th and the 9th of November 1989, went to Poland, spent on the 9th of November, spent the day in Auschwitz. And nobody in that night, no, not a single person said to us, have you heard, have you heard the Berlin Wall's coming down? Not a single person. <laughs> we, met, we, we hung out with these students all for like three days, you know, uh, not one of them said, have you heard the news? Yeah. And, and, and in, in retrospect, I, re- I realized like probably they thought the only reason we were there was the fact that they thought that, you know, the wall would come down when we decided to go to Poland. They yeah. had no idea that you had to, you had to like, you know, to, to apply for a visa for Poland took three months to, to get processed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, it was like, it was mad. You know, we, we traveled through Czechoslovakia, went into the Tatra Mountains, Nobody said a bloody word to us, you know. Like, no one said, oh, yeah, the world, the world, the world's come down. Nothing. We went out to discotheques and danced with all these people and these girls, and no one said anything, you know, like, have you heard the world's come down? Yeah. No information. We get to Hungary, no information, until we get almost to the Romanian border, and I've come to this hotel for our lunch, and I just went in the, in the hotel reception and said, have you got newspapers? And he goes, I've only got these old newspapers. And he gave us a pic- paper, and it was a picture of a guy drinking a bottle of champagne, and it, uh, on the top of the Berlin Wall, and it said, "East German tro- troops tear down wall." And I'm like, "What? what? It's some kind of like Hungarian satire." <laughs> it's, it's like, "No, this is it. This has really happened." You know? And we, we, we travelled all the way to Romania. We, weren't on, we wanted to go to, to Dracula's Castle and go to Bucharest and stuff. We yeah. never made it to Bucharest. The security party came to us and said, "Oh, you know, tomorrow." They're going to be uh, closing the border between, you know, to Hungary. And I'm like, does that mean he goes, well, it was ever in the country, stays in the country. So my mate Trevor's like, because he was the only one who had a driving license, he's like, I'm not staying here, I'm leaving. <laughs> so that was it then. We, we had to leave. And, it, you know, it all te- only taken us about the best of about three or four days to drive all this way to where we were. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, but it meant we had to drive nonstop the top speed of about 30 kilometers an hour because there's no motorways or anything in Romania. It's all dirt track. So it took us, it took us literally like 24 hours to get back to the border. And we just managed to get there just before the, the, the before the, um, before they closed the border at five o'clock. We got there about quarter to five. Wow. And strip, strip search. Just, <laughs> I thought we'd be like, this is it now. We're not, not going to let us out, you know. But we managed to get out, and we came back into Hungary, and it felt like, oh, we come back into civilization. You could get something to eat, there was electricity, you know, people yeah. were quite nice. And then we went on to, to Czechoslovakia, and we, we drove straight into the revolution, basically. Yeah? Right. And by, by the time we got to Prague, um, you know, it was like full on revolution. We got to Prague to see my friend, to go to my friend's house, David's house. And... Um, it's like, oh, there's a revolution. You know, it's just made a meeting on Wenceslas Square. So we're like, let's go, let's go. And we went there and it was like, you know, f- full on there. We were, you know, slap banging their revolution. Right. And after, wow. like, after I think, I said, after about the third day, it was like, this ripple came through the crowd of cheers. It was like, what's happened? And it's like, oh, the government has just collapsed. And suddenly there's my friend, Sasha Vondra, who's Alexander Dubček and Václav Havel waving to the thousands of people on back. Square. It was like, wow! It was like you know, the week two weeks before he was in prison, you know, yeah. near the year because because he was a spot. He was the press spokesman for Charter Seventy Seven. There he is waving to the crowd. You know, it was like it was really weird. And, wow! And, you know, and you come came back to Berlin and like nothing was the same again. It had been completely, you know, we, it was the the they'd stolen Disneyland. I, I'm, I'm very I'm very, I feel very privileged as well that I was you know given this opportunity to experience that. No, yeah. Now, I I found a uh, a great video on YouTube of you playing on the Gleinicke Bridge, aka the Bridge of Spies. Mm. Can you tell me a bit about that? It was a video shoot for a, yeah. for a, a TV program called Music Box, which was like a cable music program precursor to MTV. And I and after doing the tube, the people for I, I did a quite a few of programs as well and, and one of them was that the, the music box decided they wanted to come to berlin with uh, ray cokes and uh, julie brown 
and they do this TV special, this Music Box TV special. So I took Julie Brown, Ray Cokes around Berlin and showed them everything, met all these bands and organised the entire shoot and everything. I did for the shoot. And um, the the producer of the programme, because he knew I was in a band, mm-hmm. they'd organised that that we would do, that my band would perform at the opening ceremony of the, um, was it cable TV being released in Germany? You know, that, you know, like, officially, the cable TV release in Germany would be in, uh, in Berlin and, and there'd be this big gig and we would perform at this gig. This was the yeah. my idea. So we do our gig and it, and it comes up with this bright idea that, that before they go home, they'd like, to, they'd like to film my band performing on Woodland Ica Brooklyn like, after, after seeing the two, we really wanted to do this. Yeah. And I'm like, well, it took me like the best part of three months to get to permission to film on the bridge. It was like, it's like, I can't do this overnight. He goes, oh, I'll just have a go, you know. And luckily, because I knew the people who worked for AFN and, and stuff, mm-hmm. in the meantime, you know, doing the tube, I got to know them really well. And I knew the head of AFN and he could pull a lot of strings. I just said, can you help us out here? And he, and he, and he managed to get us a permit for the afternoon. So not, like this is in the morning, I'd like trying to get this permit. And he got us a permit so you can go there now. You can do it now. So we, we you know, got guitars and everything, just re- raced down to the, to the clinic in Brooklyn, just as the sun's setting. And, and as the sun's setting, we do this take, you know, like on the bridge. And we're supposed to, we, we decided we were going to be spies coming in from the cold, you know. That's why we're all dressed in rain max with plasters because we've been beaten up in prison in East Berlin. <laughs> the only problem was is that the, the, the Americans didn't have time to inform the Russians on the other side of the bridge. So the Russians thought there was some kind of third world war scenario going on. And so these Germans are in a real flap and the Russians are in a real flap. And it was like, you know, the American soldiers turned up with big machine guns and everything to protect us and our freedom when we made this blooming stupid video. So you almost caused an international incident by uh, doing this video shoot. Yeah, unadverted, inadverted we did. Yeah. yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And are you still in touch with uh, the people you knew in the East? Unfortunately, only a few. Uh, most of the people that evaporated, you know, yeah. over, over the years. One reason or another, some left Germany, some stayed somewhere. I don't know, like my immediate friends, all of them have disappeared. Uh, it's really sad. Apart from you know my, my Czech friends, like Jakim Topol and, 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 and David Copeland and people like this, I'm still friendly with them. I saw them actually a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, um, you know they, they've they've remained true friends. You know, but all the others, they all evaporated out of my life. You know. Uh, very very sad that I felt like you know, that they only really wanted to use me for my contact. That's really, yeah, that's, that that's life, really. You know, so it is. Yeah, you know? yeah. And and how would you describe Berlin now as a city? Oh, thrilling! Still thrilling. That's it's good for me. For me, it's still a thrilling place. It's still an evolving place. It's still the same place as it always used to be. It still attracts the same people. Really, you know. Yeah. It doesn't have the you know, the kind of like Cold War element and of, of fear and mm. division and things. That's all. That's dissipated a little bit. It's maybe in people's minds, in, in a way, you know, in certain types. But in generally, it still attracts the same kind of people as it's always attracted. You know, people who feel a bit. If you if you if you if you're a gay man or a transvestite living in some village somewhere, you're gonna get your finger pointed at you every day. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you just come to Berlin and you'll be feeling all right. You know, There's, nothing's gonna to happen to you. Whereas, you know, it's like it's like it's, oh, you know, if you're an artist, struggling artist, you know, you can't afford to live in London, you can't afford to live in America, you can't afford to live in Paris or whatever. You can come to Berlin because you know, even though people in the Berliners complain about this rising rents. Compared to anywhere else, the rents are still really cheap here. No, absolutely. Have you got any souvenirs or anything that you've kept from the Cold War times? Tons of stuff, yeah. <laughs> What's the tons, highlights? Tons, tons. Give us the edited highlights. Um, well, I once smuggled an East German army uniform out of East Berlin, um, which was very reckless of me to do that, really. I mean, yeah. if I'd have got caught wearing that, I have no idea what they've done to me. It was like, you know, they just introduced the, the one stripe, no stripe 
camouflage uniform and I really liked it. It was nice, really cool. Man. And a friend of mine, no, it, like, it, like there were no second hand shops where you could buy a, a surplus, like in the best. Yeah. You know, it was like, it was like you got the uniform, it had a number on it, it had your name in it, and that was it. And you had to keep that until you, until you if you ripped it or something, maybe you, you could get another one. But other than that, you had that one uniform, that was it. And this one friend of mine, he managed to get this uniform. And it was an entire uniform. It wasn't just a jacket and trousers. It was a, it was a complete uniform, including overalls, tank helmet, <laughs> steel helmet, <laughs> boots, everything. The whole the whole works right. And the and then this camo uniform, and I was like, oh, I've got to have that. And I thought I'll, I'll smuggle bits out over a period of months. You know. Yeah, I was going to say I can't imagine you just got that out in one chunk, but. Oh no, I didn't. I, I, but the first, the first, the first thing was getting this camo camo uniform out. First of all, you know? yeah. And it was like uh, I put it on underneath my suit. I, had a, I, I was always like a jacket on. So, you know, I put it on there. My mate Alistair was looking at me, just like, "There's no way I'm going to go over the ball for you looking like that." <laughs> it's like you, you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger with a pinhead. <laughs> It's like, and, and I'm like, and, and it was like really hot, and I was like saturated, sweating, and and I, and I thought, oh, fuck it, I'm gonna. Go. If, they, if they see me wearing this, I'm dead. Yeah. So I went to the, I went, before I got to the border, I bought a bottle of vodka, and I poured half of it away, and I and I took a really big swig of this vodka, not not as for courage, but so I yeah. have like alcohol in my breath, and then I just clutching this bottle, just pretended to be completely pissed. Yeah. St- dagger through the border c- c- controls, you know, and, th- and they were like, oh, it's another piss brick. Let's quickly get this over and done with. Yeah. So I kind of like managed to get through. And my friend Alistair, we'd, we'd, we'd actually bought 20 meters of red flag material for a malaria concert because we were going on tour with this band, Malaria. Mm-hmm. And, um, and in East Berlin, they had really beautiful flag material. So I said, oh, we look great on stage having this flag material <laughs> hanging over. So we got this flag material and then Alistair was carrying this flag material in, in this paper bag and and he's watching me going through, you know, pretending he doesn't know me. Yeah. And and I'm standing waiting in the line to go to the, the last passport controls because I pretended to be pissed. The, 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 the customs controls just kind of just went, like, right, go away, go away. And, uh, and I kind of managed to get to the last, the last passport control when these two Arab guys in front of me start having an argument attracting all the t- attention of the border guards. Mm. And my friend Alistair starts to come down the stairs at Friedrichstrasse railway station into, into the main hall. And this paper bag bursts open and this 20 metres of flag, red flag material comes cascading down the stairs. <laughs> and the, and they, the, 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 sta- the, the, the security there, the, 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 the border guards, they just immediately grabbed him and dragged him off. <laughs> oh, like, no. It, 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 here he is. He's like, doesn't want to go over me because he's frightened I'm going to get dragged off. Yeah, and here, and here he is getting dragged off, and and as he's walking away, he's like indicating with his eyes for me to look down, and and I looked down and I could see my my trousers had these drain pipes on, and I could see the bottom of this like army uniform sticking because they were a little bit longer than my trousers, yeah. and sticking out of the bottom of my trousers, and I'm thinking, oh God, look, I can't, what can I do here? I can't kind yeah. of just like wrong. And these two Arab guys are having a big argument and drawing all this attention and all these border guards are coming over. And I'm thinking, if if one of these guards just has a look at me, yeah, and and he sees that, that's it. I've, I've, and, I, and I was resigned to my fate. I thought, that's it. They, I'm, that's it now. This is this is the, this is the look of the draw. Really. Yeah, you know, I, my mate Alice has been dragged off, and now I'm going to get arrested in five minutes. And and they, they didn't they didn't look. You know, they just kind of dragged off these two Arab guys, dragged them off. And and I was left there to go over the over the border defences, and I kind of like positioned myself so that I thought that the the, the border guard, if he looked through the mirror, he couldn't see my, the bottom of my feet, you know. Yeah, and yeah. I got through, and, and I managed to get through, and, and I had wow. a uniform then. Wow. Is there the, what what? So there's the uniform. Anything else that you've that you've? Uh, well, that the, you've I managed. To get, I managed to get. I managed to get everything else out eventually as well. But that that uniform just recently in, in the Allied Museum here in Berlin, mm-hmm. in Darlim, they had an exhibition of a hundred artifacts from like east and west, and um, they exhibited my uniform with my little story 
explaining how I'd got it out of East Berlin because 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 the, the, you know like it was it was a very it was a very rare artifact the, probably the only uniform in the West right from East Berlin and mm-hmm. and the the, the US Army uh, they really wanted to have this uniform they kept bothering me about it asking yeah. me when if I would sell it because they wanted it you know and I'm like what do you want it for oh, well, we just you know, we need it. We'd like to have it. You know, what are you going to do? You know, I thought they're going to break it to be flat at one point. Probably. <laughs> um, you know. How? So what was it? It wasn't, it wasn't just a regular Volks army uniform yeah, then. It was, yeah, it was, it was a regular Volks army. Uniform. Oh, right. Yeah. But, it, but, but it's but just, it, they'd never seen one in the West at that point because the they, war was they, still They'd there. never seen one in the flesh yeah. <laughs> or, or in the cloth. Yeah. You know, they'd only ever seen the photographs. And they, so yeah. they had no idea how it was made. Yeah. You know what it was made from, whether the chemicals that they used to dye it, whether they could be picked up with sensors and all. They, yeah. you know, they, they, was it was it was it a uniform that had been coloured with vegetable colouring yeah. like British uniforms were? You know they needed it for that. They, they wanted to replicate yeah. it basically. You know, must have been an interesting uh, visit to the dry cleaners when you wanted it clean. Nah, nah, I didn't take it anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it, you know, it, it, it stayed. I mean, my wife sometimes wears my jacket, actually. <laughs> What's to my concern? But, um, you know, it's, 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 just, it's an artifact. Which, I mean, today you can just go to the flea market yeah. and get one today, you know, that with no, no, no incident surrounding, you know. But the, yeah. uh, back then it was a real... It was yeah, a, but yours has got a real story behind it, which is, uh, makes, it, makes it much more interesting. Yeah, that's why they put it on display. Um, so in, in Berlin... You know, where, where would you recommend that people could just go and see a part of Berlin that still feels a bit like uh, the GDR? Is there oh, anywhere that, that? Yeah, you have to go out in the outskirts of Berlin. Yeah, you know, go to somewhere like Matam or something like that. You know, yeah, uh, go, go out in the sticks a little bit. Um, it's all changing, of course. It's all been renovated, so it's not it's not so easy to find. To be honest, but. If the, the further out you get out of Berlin, the more likely you are to see more things that are very kind of like East Berlin or something. Yeah. Okay. Like Pankow is still not changed that much, really. You know, yeah. A few of the buildings have been renovated, but it's not that. It's not. It's still the same kind of feeling. You know, you can still go to a really shabby restaurant and get swore at by the people who are standing in there smoking a cigarette and you say, can I have some more bread and the bowl the rice and tut and kind of put the fag out and then bring you yeah. some bread that, that they had cut like two or three days ago. You know, you can still yeah. find that in East Berlin. Still get that East German service then if you yeah, the, look hard enough. The surly, the surly service of the East Germans. You know, so you still get that sometimes. You know? Yeah. I think people have views of the GDR and the Stasi and, and you know, that they they have that viewpoint, but is there anything about the GDR that you think people might be unaware of, or anything that you found really surprising? Well, I mean, yeah, sure. There's I think there's a million and one things I think that people don't know. You know, I mean, just the fact that you couldn't go to a, a music shop and buy a, the records that you wanted. You know, that was one mm-hmm. thing. But or or even for that matter, an instrument. Yeah, they didn't make them. Any, they made they made it classical instruments in East Berlin, like violins and things, acoustic guitars. But you couldn't find an electric guitar, and and there were no shops that sold them. Yeah. And you needed a permit to be able to own one, and you needed a permit to be able to play one. Yeah, and so and and then and and and, and once you got the guitar, you had to find an amplifier, and once you got the amplifier, you had to find a cable that would and and, and a jack plug that you could plugins and these are all things that weren't available it wasn't like you went to the shop and you went and bought yourself a cable yeah. i'll do it myself you know i'll solder that cable with that jack plug and make myself a cable but neither was the cable available nor was the jack plug yeah and, and you might have a guitar you might even have a, acquired an amplifier but plugging it together was an impossible because you couldn't find it even, even the smallest thing like buying an iron or a, or a toaster it came with a separate plug but it, the plug wasn't in the box it was something which was part of the five-year plan. So you'd buy a toaster, and then you might have to wait like a year and a half to be able to buy the plug. And then you've got the plug for the toaster, but they don't have the actual plug that goes into the wall needs also to be fitted on the other end. But they they're also part of the five-year plan too. So if you don't have a plug at home already, you have to wait another two years before they make 
uh, enough plugs that you can yeah. actually buy one to put on the on the end of your plug for your toaster. Or they'd make things like you know, sl- you get slippers in the summer and you get sandals in winter. And, and it was like yeah, oh, topsy turvy, you know. It was like a, 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 they they had. But in in the West, when we had like the the dawn of the Walkman age, right? They mm-hmm. they didn't want to be done out of this idea that people in the East could also have such a thing as a Walkman, and you'd see it in their kind of electronic shop in the middle of you know presented a East German version of a Walkman. It wasn't called a Walkman. It it looked like a brick. It was about the same size as a brick. It couldn't fit in any pocket, <laughs> but it was sort of a small portable cassette player. Cost like you know, two and a half thousand East German marks. Well, you, 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 your average East German earned 600 marks a month. So, you know, it's yeah. like a, a Traband cost 10,000 East German marks and, and, and their version of a Walkman cost two and a half thousand, you know, it's like a television yeah. set cost two and a half thousand. Yeah. So it's like, it was like, you know, people didn't have it because it was just like out, yeah. out of everybody and everybody's price range. Yeah. Do you th- do you think there was anything good about the GDR? Oh yeah, loads of stuff. You know, it wasn't just cheap and and, and affordable drinking and eating. Yeah. Um. I th- you know, I think that there was a lot of really positive things on the social level, which I thought were really good. You know, the way they treated the the, uh, the mothers, for example, if you had a baby, you got a year off work, so you could look yeah. after you, look after your kid, full pay, and the minute you, your child went to kindergarten, you you got your job back. You yeah, know, there's like these kind of things. Really, it's a lot of social things. The, the whole system was geared around making kids happy. So everything was like, you know, you go to the, the toy shops, and the toy shops would be like Lavin's Cave. Was, I, mean, I, I thought to myself, if I wanted, if it was a, a kid in East Germany, it must be fantastic being a kid in East Germany. Yeah, you know, you, you know, all these like fascinating space toys they had, and like tanks and stuff. Remote yeah. control. Uh, it was all. It was all. It was amazing. Yeah, it's like brilliant stuff. You know, uh, of course we had all these kind of stuff in the West as well. But like, it, I remember. I think you know my my attraction for the East stems back from being a small child when I used to collect stamps as a kid. I, you know, I, it's, I'd collect stamps from the, all over the place, but the ones from Eastern Europe, like Czechoslovakia and stuff, it all had, it had technology on it, like space technology, rockets, Yuri Gagarin, you know, all kind of stuff, satellites. Or it had, you know, tanks and trains and planes. Or it had smiling children. Now, growing up in Manchester in the 60s and 70s, it was a really f- miserable place, you know. It was like yeah. everyone was on strike and no one had any money. In the wintertime, you were dying of smog inhalation, you know. It was a really grim childhood, you know, in the place where we grew up as, like, working-class kids. And, yeah. and uh, you know, this happy, smiling children on these stamps, always like, it was quite attractive, you know. It was like, well, they're all happy, why are they all happy so that was, I think that was some kind of like subliminally ingrained image I had of Eastern Europe that when I actually went to East, Eastern Europe and saw it, I loved it. I loved everything about it. You know, the, I loved the crapness about it. I loved the yeah. improvisation. I loved the way the people clubbed together to kind of help each other out. Everybody knew somebody who could do something for you, you know. Yeah. Uh, the, the, one, the one thing which, was, which I, I discovered was, the the currency of of getting your phone fixed or your car fixed or your or your heating fixed or whatever it wasn't even Western currency it, that wasn't that wasn't the thing that people wanted because you could get Western currency by you know one way like you could either swap it on the street or you know you could get it off some relative or whatever what they needed to be able to do things like that was pornography and pornography was the secret currency in the whole of Eastern Europe to get your phone fixed or get your phone put in, <laughs> in fact, or get you, you know, get, if your radiator was leaking, you know, if you, if you phoned up the state owned, you know, radiator repair company, they'd come yeah. two years later. There's a waiting list as long as your arm, you know, so, yeah. so, so if, if you said, I have, you know, special magazines for you here or video cassettes it was like the guy be there in 10 minutes <laughs> got, got everything, get everything repaired. well that's not something i've uh, read about in the history book yeah. now I, th- I don't think we can you know we can finish without talking about b movie mm, okay <laughs> or do you not want to talk about b movie <laughs> well, well yeah of course you know it's been so it's a it's a uh, changed a, a part of my life really you know it's, it's documents my life in west yeah but also because it's, it's only about forgotten West Berlin, really. 
you know, it's, it's, it's obviously had some kind of impact on my life because it means I have to travel around the world showing this film. And, you know, for me, the film was really just, a, I thought, well, you know, what do people want to gain from such a film? What were they building? What do they need to know? You know, so I just kind of tried to explain the people that I met, the people that I knew, the things that I did uh, in West Berlin. There's mm. very little about East Berlin, unfortunately, because we, I wasn't allowed to film in East Berlin. Yeah. It's like you couldn't take your camera into East Berlin. Um, so it's just about this forgotten island, really, of West Berlin. And, and, and using like original footage from the time, it's not all my footage. Some things are from Necromantic, some things are from the Tube, some things are from my friends, who are, people who are new who film things, just to, to help narrate the, the, the story, really, with pictures. Um, and there's like 2% of the film we've reenacted to make links between scenes and things, but it's ne- most of it is original footage with music from the time. Yeah. You know? And uh, and with this film, you know, I travel around the world showing the movie. Because the film is an educational film. It's been, in, it's been incorporated into the school curriculum here in Berlin, or in Germany. So it's part of the history of Berlin now, so... Wow. So as it, as all these refere- knockoffs, you know, I showed B movie on the DMZ between North and South Korea, um, <laughs> at a film festival there. They projected it on the wall of this building, this huge building, so the people in North Korea could see the pictures. Even right. The Are there any books that you recommend for anybody interested in Berlin, oh, the GDR? Of course, there's the Once Upon a Time in the East by Dave Rimmer, which is an essential book to read. It's about our travels to uh, Czechoslovakia and Romania and Hungary in the final days of East German. Yeah, I have got that one and I highly recommend that one as well. Literally before the wall comes down. Well, Mark, I really do appreciate the time you've spent with me. This is far longer than I'd intended, but you've got such great stories to tell. I didn't want to stop you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope it'll be interesting forever. Who is it? Anyway? I, d- I think it will be. I mean, I have had people ask, can you interview Mark Reader? You know, it, yours is a fascinating story and a brilliant insight into areas of uh, East Germany, East Berlin that, you know, nobody else has, has really seen or experienced. So I'm, I'm delighted that, you, that you've made the time to talk to me. You're very welcome, man. No, I wish to just go out and just buy my album, Mauerstadt, then we'll be happy then. <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> the, the, musical, the musical soundtrack to the to the, the idea of like what is, you know, a the wall in people's minds now, you know, we have to get rid of that one. We'll definitely promote that and, uh, and B-movie as well. Thank you. Well, I hope you found that as insightful as I did. There's extra information in the show notes, including the infamous Glenica Bridge video that almost caused the international incident, as well as Mark's own film, B-Movie, his recommended book, and his latest album, Mauerstadt. The show notes can be found at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 12. Don't forget, you can join our discussion group on Facebook. Just search for Cold War Conversations. And we're also on Twitter, at Cold War Pod. If you like what you're hearing, please leave reviews on iTunes or with your podcast provider or share with your friends. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. (laughs) 